Hey, welcome to Pop and Corks. We got a fantastic guest. Normally we got a bunch of meathead athletes, sometimes meathead winemakers. We actually have a real smart guy today who's becoming a good friend of mine who I dig. I dig his product. Greg Lambrecht from Corvin, the uh, founder and chairman and inventor. We're even going to teach you how to cuss in Japanese, I think. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Stick around. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Pop and Corks. I'm Eric Jensen, farmer winemaker of Booker Vineyard and my favorite neighbor wines. Today I got a fantastic guest out from the East Coast. Thank goodness. We became friends over the pandemic. I was actually a longtime user of his products, the inventor of the wonderful Corvin and now multiple other products under that umbrella, Greg Lambrecht. Great to be here, Eric. Great to have you, bud. You got in last night. Yeah, I mean, it's great to physically meet in 3D uh, post-ish the pandemic. You look the same. I mean, you know, up you, close, you got a couple more fucking flaws than I went. You know, Damn I straight I do. <laughs> Proud of every one of them. I had seen it on TV. Uh, they switched our seat here. We were up against the bar. And so if you guys, uh, if I'm squinting at all, it's if I'm pirate eyeing, it's because the sun is directly in my face. But holy crap. Yeah. I mean, you so I just came from Boston where we just had a bomb cyclone. And uh, this is much, much better. I can see why you moved here and. Built this vineyard and and you see do you see that vineyard in the background up over mine? See where the quad up on the hill is? Yeah, that's all ours as well. Through a good friend of mine, uh, O'Neill Gray, we buy all the fruit off that, or uh, almost all of it. Uh, where do the where do the grapes from that vineyard go? Into your uh, ones? They're gonna start going in everything, but right now they were in my favorite neighbor. Awesome. But they're they're gonna start uh, integrating into Booker. Um, it's and wonderful to uh, over there is Catapult's vineyard that is. Uh, part of Booker as well. So we buy all the fruit off that vineyard called Catapult, and that's Epic's, Epic Winery, E P O C H. Yeah. You get a chance, stop by them. Uh, all right. So I'm not going to, because in case your people watch this, uh, <laughs> I don't want to put people to sleep with the same old story, sure. the invention, et cetera, et cetera. Just real quick, you saw a need. You were an engineering guy. Yep. You had been in uh, uh, medical. Yep. And so you said, I'm getting tired of if I don't want to drink a whole bottle or if I want to try multiple things in a night. Saw a need, typical entrepreneur, and solved the need. And went after it. I, uh, and how many years ago? So, you know, embarrassingly, 20 years ago, uh, it took me 11 years of testing to prove to myself that it worked. I wanted to be able to corve in a bottle, take out a couple of glasses, come back to it five years later, blind taste it, not be able to tell the difference. And that took eight years of testing. I was varying the needle that we use, the gas that we use, the pressures uh, that we use, the wines that I was trying, wines from all over the world. I mean, I was a California all day, every day kind of guy back then. Uh, when I first founded the company, that's what I drank. Uh, but I traveled a lot to Europe and I started drinking wines over there and I fell in love with the variety of wine that's available, Rhone in particular. Like I'm a northern and southern Rhone guy, so your wines are like right up my alley. And uh, the frustration that I had was my wife at the time, she didn't drink much wine. She was from Texas and so drank a lot of beer. Uh, and if she did like wine, it was rarely the one that I wanted. And so we were pulling a cork and one of us was compromising. You had a beer girl, huh? I did. I did. And, uh, you know, and wind up. They wanting... don't make those as much anymore. They really yeah. don't. Texas, though, right? Yeah. Uh, lots of meat, potatoes. They're still growing them in Texas. Yeah. yeah. Still are. So uh, I was frustrated. They sell it to you by the bottle, but you drink it by the glass, ultimately. And I wanted to be able to drink three different wines in an evening on a Tuesday. And uh, luckily, I developed one of the first products that I worked on in my career in medicine was a chemotherapy delivery system that had an implant under the skin. Uh, over the course of somebody's therapy, they would access it with a needle. Uh, and so I got really good at making needles that went in and out of things without doing any damage. And, and I remember saying to myself, you know, I've got to pull the cork on this bottle. As soon as I do, a little bit of air gets in, but when I pour, a lot of air gets in, and now I'm on a clock. Uh, what I really wanted to do was drink any wine from any bottle I had in any quantity I wanted, whenever I wanted, without having to think about when I was going to go back and drink it again. I want to be able to check your wines. I mean, your wines age beautifully. They're great to drink right now, but they also age. And so I wanted to see how it evolved over time. I wanted to see if that was the right wine for tonight. Uh, all these different things that I wanted to do, I couldn't do. So I remember sitting in my, my kitchen holding a bottle of $10 Spanish wine <laughs> that I didn't really want uh, and a needle going, there's got to be a way I can get wine out of there with this. And so came up with the idea, tested it for 11 years, launched the company in 13, 
Uh, now we're in 60 countries. Uh, we've served over 150 million glasses of wine. And you're a household name. For those of you who don't know, Coravin is now Band-Aid or Coke. <laughs> uh, you just say, just Coravin it. Yeah. And you could, there may be a competitor. I don't even know if there is. Just like I never knew if there was a competitor to Band-Aid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But there were those products that were launched that the name just became synonymous and overtook the industry. So we're going to fast forward real quick uh, because we need to get something in our glass. I had tested a couple bottles to make sure they weren't corked. So this is the one thing. This is the item I'm really, really excited about because we drink a gas load of champagne. <laughs> and you went to a local uh, producer of uh, sparkling here. Of course, we can't call it champagne. So let's put the holy grail to work. The Coravin that will work, which I still don't understand how, on a champagne bottle. Oh, so there I'm going to just put my glass out. and <laughs> Yep, you got it. I'm going to give you a champagne glass. Oh, we're going to go with champagne Yeah, these are beautiful. I mean, Sophia yeah. involved, man. These are awesome glasses. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I love sparkling wine, but I never opened it. Like, sparkling wine goes bad in two ways. It oxidizes and it goes flat. And uh, particularly, it goes flat. And so I talked to a lot of people that are like, oh, well, we always finish the bottle. And I was like, well, that's because you have well, What are to. you doing? You're putting... I know. I'm opening the bottle. Prepare yourself oh, to be okay. shocked. So you're not going... Because uh, I figured no. there's no chance you could go through. Okay. Well, so I spent eight years developing this. The first four, I was going through, through the cork. It. And I figured out there was an angle that was... Look at that. Almost perfect. So uh, the needle would go through at a 30 degree angle underneath the mucilage into the bottle and you could pour wine out of the bottle using a needle based system, but the wine would go through a needle and then expand and foam and go flat. So the magic trick I had was I could pour still wine from a sparkling bottle. Yeah. I could preserve the bottle, but it was not going to work. Yeah. And so we realized something that was special about sparkling. So we use argon in our still wine systems because it's yeah. heavier than oxygen and it displaces the wine so that oxygen never touches it during the pouring process. Well, with sparkling, you notice in the bottle, as soon as you open it, it's, it's bubbling. Yep. CO2 is even heavier than argon. So you can actually open bottle pour very little uh, CO2 gets, or oxygen, sorry, gets into the bottle yeah, while you're pouring. It pushes it out. It's pushing it out so right now. We don't have to protect grapes during fermentation. That's it. They, they have a protective cap. It's called the CO2. Same, same Anything thing. microbial is being protected. It yep. just, it, yeah. Yeah, so you do an open bottle pour. It's pushing the oxygen out. And then we've got a stopper that fits on literally every bottle. This was one of the hard parts. Uh, there are, I'd say it was probably the hard part yeah. since your first idea failed. Oh but, my, uh, yeah, exactly. So that, I thought it was going to be easy to do it. Okay. we we'll open bottle pour. We just need to cap it. And then we need to find a way to protect the perlage. So we came up with a, a universal stopper. We tested it on hundreds of bottles. I got to tell you, my, uh, my pandemic was better than most people's pandemics. Cause that's what I was doing was developing Corbin sparkling and uh, testing all sorts of different wines. It's got this little handle that closes around the neck of the bottle. It's so universal. It'll fit on uh, half bottles up to a magnum of any wine. It'll fit on beer. Uh, and then this seals the bottle. We have a special medical material that doesn't allow any oxygen out or in or any CO2 out. Uh, and then we've got a charger that protects the prolage and restores it using uh, pure CO2. So we don't use argon anymore. We use CO2. It's got a little indicator. Well, just for champagne. Just for champagne. Yeah. Uh, and it's got a little indicator that's red when it's empty. You puncture it, it goes green. Now you know you've got gas. And to restore the prolage, you simply press down. It'll go from green to red, back to green again when you're done, and that's it. So you can now drink this sparkling wine. Last glass will be just as good as the first one month later. And I've done tests now out to three, four, five, six months. Yeah, but for, yeah, one, no one's got, no one's a, gonna leave it no one's got a champagne cellar with 2,000 bottles, right? I've we met some. We have wine some. cellars, yeah. but very... I mean, it's not common. It's the anomaly. It's not common. But so uh, give me a month and I'm yeah. fucking golden. There we go. So yeah. I have six bottles. I used to never drink sparkling. Now I've got six bottles of sparkling wine uh, in my wine fridge. And I'll have a different glass of sparkling wine. My spouse will have another one. She'll have whatever she wants. Uh, we can have a rosé sparkling. We've done sparkling pairings at home. Uh, totally changes everything. And then restaurants. Do you sell up. those separately? Yep. Because that's got to happen. Because if you want two or three bottles, that's I don't want to rebuy the whole kit. So the time. system comes with four capsules. Each capsule will preserve up to seven bottles of sparkling. Uh, it comes with two stoppers. Uh, so you can immediately start with two bottles of wine. Yeah. And then we sell them in packs of four. They last forever, fit on everything. Uh, so you can get yourself up to six bottles. Consumer easy didn't seem scary, but you're no. a pro. No, that's easy. And so when you open it, and I, you can't 
you can't well cheers first thank you for having me here man thank you for getting me out of boston as well Sorry about that, Boston folk. It, we love you, Boston. It's just, it just isn't California. It's winter right now, and so <laughs> bomb cyclone. So uh, that right, Pepper. So we, we made this so that you could use it in a restaurant. One of the things they were worried about in a restaurant was sound. They didn't want a popping sound. So if you want a popping sound, you just lift up on the lever, and it'll make a popping sound. But if you want to release the gas before, we built in a feature. You just tilt it, and then, whoops, and then pop it open. And that's it. Then pour again. Shit. Looks. Yeah. yeah. Here you I'm go. good. You're good. Yeah. Cap it. Simple. You can do it with one hand. And then pressurize, store, and you're done. That's it. That's pretty banging. I was <laughs> waiting to see this one. Uh, all right. What else we got? What 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 else is Cora been working on? Because obviously, if you're you know, you're running a company, for everybody out there that works for or runs a company, I think everyone, most people out there have a job, but you can't just be a one trick pony, right? So if yeah. you just, you could, because then you keep getting better iterations, bigger needles. Um, oh, by the way, with the bigger needles, especially, you can't leave the thing in there. You shouldn't right. with any of them. That's right. So my favorite use of Corbin is put the needle through, press and, and displace your wine, pour whatever you want, take the needle out. Yeah. Uh, cork is a natural substance. It's actually one of the most elastic substances on the surface of the earth, which is why we use it. Um, and it'll reseal after the needle comes out. But it is natural, so it'll take a set if you leave the needle through for a long time, particularly with a bigger needle. So we sell a couple of different kinds of needles, uh, vintage for really old, standard, which I use on everything, fast flow if you're in a hurry, um, and you can swap them in and out real easily. Uh, the, you know, when I founded the company, I said, our goal is to always make Coravin faster, easier, more fun, independent of closure. So screw cap, we launched Coravin screw cap, so you can uh, put our screw cap on, treat it like a cork. Uh, wine will last for a year. And then we developed, and then I said, so fast reads are more fun, independent of closure, still are sparkling. So that was the goal of our company. And the other mission is to expand the ways that wine can be drunk, served, and sold. And so I think with sparkling, I, I was asked by this reporter, he's like, so you've achieved your goal. You've developed all these systems. You've met your purpose. What are you going to do now? Are you in like a some sort of existential crisis. And uh, I said, no, you know, actually the next thing we're doing, which I can't talk about yet, is maybe even the coolest thing we've ever done. And what do you uh, got, your own fucking NDA? You sure you can talk about it. <laughs> you guys are under NDA. I just can't do it here. <laughs> what do you mean I can't talk about it? <laughs> You'll I'm see the it. owner. You know what's funny is like, that- Is it a robot? I mean, is it fucking a helicopter? We've got it, we've got it in the car. Like land here? I mean, we're, I, we're actually going to show it to you, but everybody told me, do not show it to Eric before the podcast because you'll talk about it. Of course I will. I know. And you know how hard it is for me? Like they try to muzzle me all you the time. You guys don't like leaking? You don't like leaking stuff out there? Not yet. Not yet. Why would we'll, we'll give Chelsea, you? Chelsea, remind me to never, <laughs> ever, as long as I'm still calling shots at Booker to not leak shit. That gets people excited. I Pepper, know, Maxie. I mean, yeah or no? Oh, yeah. Actually, These two you know, fucking East Coast guys. They get on out to the West. Pepper, don't give me that. We're shit. filing all of our patents. So as soon as the patents are filed, oh, okay for patents. Yeah, yeah, as soon as the patents are filed, you will be the man who will release the information. I will make all sure right, that you all have. Right, all right, I like it. <laughs> you uh, have the freedom to do it. I've got. Uh, NFL guys uh, on the list. I got MLB guys that drink the wine and they love, I turned them on to your stuff because, you know, if, if they're all bringing a bottle yeah, and they're not going to sit around forever in the locker room or the dugout after the, you know, the, not the dugout, but the locker room after the game, if it's MLB or football, but now those locker rooms are very nice, but they, you know, they want to finish up and they have a glass with their bodies. They love being able to, you know, all bring a bottle and then they, you know, they're trying all of them instead of being committed that they got to kill 10 bottles and get in the car and, you know, get on the road. That's the other greatness of Corvin. It kind of chips into the, hey, you know, I can taste this and I don't have to. You can share it. Yeah. You can bring a bottle you wouldn't otherwise. Because who, who, I mean, I'm sure you as a winemaker don't want half your bottle sitting there oxidizing at the end of a tasting. I right? end up giving them to the kids. Yeah. I end up uh, just bringing them down to the winery and... Huh. You know, hey, I'm, I, I take a couple sober nights off. Uh, so, you know, I just take them down to the winery. If I'm taking two nights off, no matter what it is, it could be fake Davisad. It yeah. could be real Davisad. Uh, <laughs> let's jump in. Let's jump into a white. And then yeah. I, I got some questions. So we're going to pour a quick white here. We'll take a break and uh, 
We'll be right back. We'll jump into that uh, fake data shot. I don't even know what it is. There it's we go. Chablis, yeah, but it's got the right label, right? It, it fooled looked, you. It, it looked like it. <laughs> we'll be right back. Popping Corks is a podcast sponsored by My Favorite Neighbor Wines. Visit MyFavoriteNeighbor.com and use the promo code Popping Corks for complimentary shipping on any order of three bottles or more. That's a phenomenal deal, by the way. And don't forget to follow us at My Favorite Neighbor on Instagram. Hey, we're back at Poppin' Corks. Greg Lambrecht, founder, owner? Inventor. Inventor. Partial owner. Partial I've owner. I've raised money. You've done money raised. Of course you have. Yeah. That's the thing, right? From really good uh, people that are I Are you like. a president or CEO title or? Founder, chairman. Just chairman founder, chairman. Yeah. So they brought in so fucking. They know Who actually knows consumer products. And scooted you over to the side a little well, bit. Well, it was my choice, actually. You know, I, I was running a medical company at the time, and I realized Clearly that, not that well uh, to, to ask someone else to run your company. Well, it's doing really well. I'm teasing No, you. totally okay. I mean, I'm a good development front-end guy, and uh, in med tech, that takes 10 years, 15 years. And now, of course, Corvin did the same thing. But uh, I knew how to run a medical company. I had no idea how to run a consumer product company. I, I listen. It, I, I did the same thing. I, yeah. You know, I I needed a general manager to do the things that I wasn't good at, didn't want to do, uh, and didn't necessarily have the the genes to do. So you know, in fact, if someone's better at it, let and we can all win. Um, yeah, let them let them run with it instead of you know I was always just a farmer and a winemaker and an idea guy, maybe a, a little bit of art I could bring to the deal and 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 some design stuff. But other than that, the actual business stuff I was never really good. You do at. great farming and you do great. Marketing. That's it. But but di didn't didn't you know? Yeah. I was nice to everybody. I couldn't fire anybody. Yeah. So I had to hire right. So I just didn't hire because I'm like shit. If I hire and I'm wrong, I got to fire. That's why we never grew originally. <laughs> so kind of the French mentality because they can't fire you. Yeah. Uh, so I requested we jump into some uh, Chablis here. And you, you've I've got, got another, the new pivot. Oh yeah, I've got another which new I system. I had not heard about. So this is a yeah, pandemic. Uh, we had uh, we had our engineers were the only ones allowed in the office during the pandemic, and it was the most creative period of their existence. This is a concept that I came up with flying back from Australia before the pandemic. And uh, this, I had met this restaurateur, and he said, "I like Corbin, but it pours too slowly for my restaurant, and if the person doesn't know how to use it, they waste gas." And after four or 500 uses, and he was using a lot, the needle wears out and I got to change them. Um, I would like something that takes no training, uh, pours really fast and works on any closure. And so uh, I came up with this idea on an airplane and I was like, you know, we, we, for the longest time, Corbin said, we're the guys who pour wine from a bottle without opening it. And I was like, that is not what we do. What we do is we pour wine from a bottle so that the last glass is as good as the first whenever you want to drink it. And however we achieve that goal, we should be able to do it. And, uh, and so we realized that the most air that gets into a bottle is not from when the bottle is opened, from, but it's from when it's being poured. And so we said, okay, hey, what if we open the bottle, put in our own stopper with a little valve in it. We can use a big honking tube instead of a needle. It can pour really fast, take no training, never wear out. And so came up with Pivot. And then the guys during, uh, so this, this is- You're gonna have less usage though, because you are up taking air now, which is what you were not doing with the old system. So actually, no. I mean, air does not get in during this process in any detectable way, um, but it, it's, it's all the material used in the stopper, actually. One of the, maybe this is a giving away too much, but the entire industry used silicon rubber to stopper bottles. And as it turns out, silicon rubber is like an open window to oxygen. It is the single most permeable elastomer on the planet. And, uh, and so we were like, hey, we'll look for another material. And we found some materials that we use in medicine that don't allow any oxygen in, don't allow any CO2 out. And we use it in our stopper. We're beginning to use it in everything we've got. And so we realized we could open the bottle, not pour, quickly place our stopper like so. And you'll hear it. Yeah. There's a little valve at the top that makes sure that air doesn't get in. And then we place this big tube through the, uh, through the valve, I tip it sideways, press this button, you're pouring immediately. You can see how fast it's pouring. Wow. Right? Fucking heavy pour. You start pouring right? like that. I'm hey, sorry, you're, yeah. gonna, you're not going to need to pivot. You're going to kill the bottle. Right, <laughs> exactly. So I was doing that for effect, but you can, you can vary the pour speed if you want. And then you take this out, cap it, and this wine will last a month. But it isn't going to last. Not for years. The years. That's right. But either way, this is way more restaurant. Oh, yeah. 
zero right. training, fast pour. They open up their wine list to more wines by the glass, not just the highest of the high end. So, uh, you know, I, I, and actually for restaurants, most of them, they go through a bottle in a month, no problem. Right? Yeah. I, I, and by the way, I think I would like this more. I Listen, I love Coravin, yeah. but... I'm getting away from what I used to do during the pandemic where I had two rows of just, we're going through everything. Yeah. In fact, so I, I, I think I told you this the first time we got together. It was the greatest way to teach the kids because you know, what do you got to do? So every night we're eating caviar and drinking champagne. Yeah. But we didn't want to kill, you know, uh, a specific bottle. We wanted to t teach the kids. Uh, uh, Jake was probably 21, Max 20. Uh, you know, we're more European, I yeah. guess. Uh, VV, <laughs> VV 16. Speed between kids. VV's 18. Uh, <laughs> Max is now almost uh, uh, 22. Jake's 23. We were teaching them about all the regions of the world, even California. Yeah. And so we didn't want to kill a whole bottle. We're like, okay, here we're going to start with a lighter wine. Yep. And then we're going to move to a medium body. We're going to go heavy. And here's heavy from this part of the world. Here's heavy from that part of the world. So what happened is we started doing it so much. We had so many bottles we had tapped into that I would like go to grab to go to a party and be like, shit, can I, show, <laughs> can I show up to the party? Will they know? I'll just hurry up and open it before. They're like, hey, Bad ullage. <laughs> hey, motherfucker, you already hit that bottle. That's re -gifting. Feels terrible. Oh. <laughs> we, had a, we had a winery in Bordeaux, Chateau Margaux, who was using Corvin to test the wines before they sent them to an event to make sure they weren't corked. And so the, the, one of the shows said, hey, your fill level sucks. Like, what's wrong with your, your new vintage? And they're like, no, 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 it's okay. We just tested it. I did the same thing with my kids. And, uh, and you know, over my house, I had 800 different wines in my wine cellar. I, by the time I developed Corvin, I was testing through all these different wines. My wine cellar looks like a wine store. They're all from all over the world. And so I had these two kids, Cord and Walker, and, and uh, they were pouring me blind tastings from the age of three, right? So they were pouring me different glasses, control versus whatever I was testing. Uh, and then they started to smell the wines when they were six or seven years old. They were smelling through everything, really learning about the wines. And I didn't know if they were going to like it in the end. Uh, but both of them fell in love with wine. Uh, their, their, their dorm rooms in college uh, had a big wine fridge oh, and a tiny desk, right? And they were loaded up with wines. And, uh, and they had, like Corbin, that's, that's how they showed their friends. They took the same educational, because I'd show them Chardonnay from around the world. I'd show them, here's a Rhone wine from Paso. Here's a Rhone wine from the, the south of Rhone or the north of Rhone. And they would know what they smelled and tasted like. It's awesome. My buddy, good friend, Bill Newlands, who's the CEO of Constellation, he's done that with his kids. He, he, they weren't drinking it. Uh, I don't know why, but you know, that's his deal. Uh, uh, they would sit around the dinner table and everyone went blind and his kids were freaking yeah, geniuses. Amazing, right? They were like, you know, yeah. I think his daughter won the college. She might've beat me. I, 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 I can say that. I, she grew she up with him in 14. Yeah. No, I think I won that. Night. It was Australia. <laughs> it was like, Oh two, but the daughter was right there yeah. and he would make them every night. Him and his great wife, Kathy, they sit around and the kids are, a part of it, guessing at all this yeah. stuff. I can't wait to be at that dinner table once all the kids are, you know, imbibing and yeah. uh, what a blast that'll be. But I like this because I want to move away from hitting 50 bottles in my cellar via Coravin. Yeah. I'd rather just have six bottles open yep. and then I can share them to also good, you know, cause I live, you know, the winery is over our shoulder on the other side of that hill. It's a Beautiful. quad right away. Yeah. I've got my dad and brother down here. Uh, there's always a friend, you know, around. So I like that. The, the month is enough for me. I want to get on a cycle where I'm not leaving them so long because yeah. then I just started building up too much inventory of Coravin wine. Tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> the 800 wines in my cellar. I think I had the largest wine by the glass program in the world for a while until 67 Paul Mall in London uh, beat me just recently. But it's, you know, one of the things I would do is when people came over, I'd say, go down to the cellar and grab, grab you want. Yeah, yeah, grab however much you want. There's a, so one, one rock musician and classical musician, he does both. Uh, he, I called it the night of 35 wines. Cause he went downstairs. He came up with nine bottles. I was like, okay, nine bottles. And he then goes, goes downstairs again, gets another nine, goes downstairs, gets another nine, comes up finally 35 different bottles. And I was like, okay, well, he's a rock musician. Who am I to judge? And, uh, he lays them out. It was Chardonnay from around the world. It was Cabernet from around the world. It was Syrah from around the world. It was Riesling from around the world. And he had a notebook. And he was like, teach me. 
this is my opportunity. So in your in your gig, right? Because now you know you're this famous guy that owns this. You know, so when you walk in, in the wine industry, anyways, is your life? Are are you at like uh, World Series and Super Bowl and all these big events? Or are you more still really focused in the restaurant industry and the wine business? Like you're. Or are you even tied with the wineries? Or are you more just strictly on consumer products and, and dealing with restaurants? This is one of the things that shocked me most about Coravin. I knew that it was for people like me, and I didn't know how many people like me there were. I wanted to be able to drink a glass of white, a glass of red, and dessert wine on a Tuesday. That's that's what I was looking for. I wanted to show my friends whatever. It's a sharing beverage, right? There's, I think it was uh, Marquis d'Angerville in Burgundy who said, you know, he stood up and during a blind taste, and he goes, wine is the most social beverage. And uh, he's right. And so I wanted to be able to share more. Uh, and the so most social beverage because it inspires us to speak about it, to talk, yeah. to, you know, discuss. And it's what, always over food. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's a wonderful. 100%. Yeah. It's, and I believe that. And it's like a big part of my soul and has been since I was illegally 16, I guess. Uh, my first wine from here in California. But uh, what I, I sort of guessed that restaurants would use it. Um, and restaurants have been phenomenal for us. And then I didn't know about importers and distributors of wine and how much they use it. And there's tens of thousands of them. All my sales teams, it's in their bag. Yeah, everybody, everybody gets a, a standard issue uh, Corbin. Yeah, and it's it's amazing how broadly it's being used. Sparkling is being picked up. We're now the, the official wine preservation system of Moen Hennessy, which is Krug, Dom Perignon, Ruinar, Veuve Clicquot. Uh, so, you know, uh, our, our products get picked up by the winemakers. And I that was a piece I knew. Like, I wanted to make sure when we launched the the system that winemakers knew about the product before anybody else. Cause we use our stuff on you, on your stuff. And if you don't know about it, don't like it, don't know what the heck this, you know, magic thing is, um, then you could have a negative reaction. And on the flip side, if you're involved, uh, from the early side, I'm going to show you this new stuff afterwards. Um, then we can make sure that it meets your needs as well. Uh, so I, and then it's been picked up, not just the United States, but France and the UK, Germany, Japan, Korea, China, Australia, New Zealand, like there is a wine culture. There's something about wine, Middle East, like we ship stuff to Dubai, you know, you would never guess. Um, but, you know, there's something about the wine culture that transcends national borders. And we've been lucky with some resistance, right? I mean, you see culture a little bit through how they react to Corbin, something really new. Uh, California picks it up right away. Well, right. you still have those. <laughs> I, I still have so many friends. That are, I, I, I why would a I, bottle. Yeah. Why, why, I'm going to kill the bottle. Why would I need that? It's right. like, yeah, but what if you want to start? One of you wants to start with a white and the other a red. Yeah. And, other or sparkling. a glass of champagne. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I've, I've had to convince them. A bottle never lasts around my house. That's always the standard. That's what they say. Line. Yeah. But uh, you can drink a bottle in the night when I say I just drink it from five different bottles. Yeah. So I have five different ones. I learned five times as fast. So you can still be a tough guy. You're saying. Yeah, exactly. You can still be, you can still be manly. I love my sales pitch in Australia. Uh, Cause they're like, Oh, I finished yeah. a bottle. And I say, well, what about the second bottle? You know, when you finish the first one, you want just one more glass. Well, we drink two bottles. And so we're like, we, our sales pitch in Australia is for the first glass of the third bottle. Yeah. <laughs> Those guys are hard drinkers. And during the pandemic, it only got worse. You're uh, <laughs> let's hit that. Uh, let's go through that uh, booker. What year is that one? What year was this? This is new. This is yeah. There's 18. Super, so the so 18, 18 what is that? This is a 13, which is, I'm really psyched to be. And so I oxidize that wine naturally. So I, I de-stem the Viognier. So it's always a little bit golden and oxidized. I mean, I love so many things about your wine and I discovered it during the pandemic when we had our first Instagram live and I fell in love with it and you. And so, uh, I am a total Rhone nutbag. Um, the Rhone's, the Rhone's awesome. And the whites uh, are the whole so wine, good. The whole wine world. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna bring out here uh, a Beau Castel, um, their 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 white, the Ville Vin, which is freaking delicious. Um, yeah, so you know, here I'm I'm using the uh, the what we call now the timeless system because the wines last forever. And uh, was that like anodized or something? Mine doesn't look that fancy. Yeah, you know, we always make it more beautiful, and somehow we because we have these amazing manufacturers, we are able to drop the cost to the consumer. I always pull mine out a lot slower. Chelsea says yank it out like that. I gotta believe that it, I probably have more last if I just kind of pull it and lift. No, right? so we made this new one. This is another thing we invented in the pandemic. Uh, the old system used to have clamps that you would manually open, manually open and yeah. close, yeah. and then you would have to remember to release them after you'd pulled the needle out. So we made these things we called smart clamps. So you can just 
push it down onto the bottle and rip it straight off and uh, protects the needle. Does really well. So another thing. All right, we're going to take a swig of this white, uh, take a quick break. We'll oh, be right back awesome. to start getting a little more personal. Let's find out uh, all these stories in other countries. I want to know if you keep, uh, you know, if it gets weird, if it gets awkward when the sun goes down. I and, get awkward. <laughs> uh, we'll be right back. Uh, hang around. Popping Corks is a podcast sponsored by My Favorite Neighbor Wines. Visit MyFavoriteNeighbor.com and use the promo code Popping Corks for complimentary shipping on any order of three bottles or more. That's a phenomenal deal, by the way. And don't forget to follow us at My Favorite Neighbor on Instagram. All right, we're back. We got a 2013 know, 13 Booker White. Very gold. It went in the bottle like that because of how I oxidized the Viognier by destemming it and treating it like a red. But it's very Northern Rune like. You know, you were saying you like. It's uh, my favorite region by far. Yeah, for whites, you know, Chapoutier and the stuff they do up there, it's just unbelievable. That density. Um, I got to remember, I'm losing my mind right now where the Gigal, uh, where they're. Uh, what is it, ex voto or is that Chapoutier? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lose my mind. Uh, I think it is Gigal, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, not their Condru, yep. uh, which is uh, Le, Doria, El Dor- Le Dorian. And a beautiful bottle. And a gorgeous bottle. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if those are northern, but I know the Chapoutier, I buy a lot of those Marsans he makes, and they're just unbelievable yes. everybody i pour them for is like oh my god what is this so it's you know people tell me it's their white wine for red wine drinkers i just think it's the most deeply fascinating yeah. expression of i mean you get you get that a little bit out of really old rieslings from germany and the alsace which have all sorts of complicated smells but i had a 1955 uh a white hermitage had a 63 or 62 white hermitage and, and they are just the most otherworldly, like smell like nutmeg and paint. And, you know, the flavors are explosive and delicious yeah. and the stuff ages forever. But I think that they are a little bit, I want to say this, whites for red drinkers. Because mm-hmm. j- just the viscosity and the density that yeah. Hermitage, M- Marsan's just, it's heavy, right? Yeah. It's not overly acidic. So, I mean, if someone's sitting there drinking Sauvignon Blanc only, that may not be the wine for them. It may be too big. Yeah. But I watch those people that, uh, I watch the folks drink Sau Blanc and then I watch them drink a, a heavy wine. So I, I, I don't think that's an unfair characteristic uh, yeah. that it's white wine for red drinkers. But what you said about all sauce, that's why I love all sauce and I love old all sauce. Yeah. I, so yeah. I'm not an old wine drinker. Me and you got into this yeah, I, we last did. time we were together. Yeah. I talk a lot of shit about old wines because I just don't like them. They disappoint 90% of the time. But I like old whites. <laughs> I, old whites I finally got you to admit. fascinate me. Oh yeah, that's right. So much yeah. old reds. I just have gotten so tired of getting my hopes up. Uh, you know, it's like as we get older. You know, you get your hopes up that you know something you good's know, gonna happen, and uh, you know someone falls asleep, and you're like, "What the hell just happened?" I had my hopes up. I had. Uh, I'm magical. not talking about any other. Sex in particular, I'm just stating what uh, happens, you know, sometimes. It, 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 they're rare, like you said, the uh, extraordinary red wine experience. You combed right over that. Yeah. Uh, Pepper, I was about to get myself in trouble. Yeah. And, <laughs> and he backed my, off. My buddy Greg just kind of got me. <laughs> Looked at, over the edge of the wave and he's like backpedaling. So I was, uh, the, we, the weirdest call that I got at Corbin was, hey, uh, I'm from the Czech Republic and we, uh, we have this church and it was owned before the war by a Nazi sympathizing Belgian guy. And he ran when the Russians were coming. And apparently he buried a reliquary and piles of jewels and a bunch of wine underground under this church that we're uh, renovating. Uh, that was a corner of the product property. And he's like, uh, we found all these bottles and they all have labels. Most of them have hey, labels. Hang on, I'll be right there. Exactly. And they're like, can you make a Coravin for bottles from the 19th century? And I was like, uh, yes, of course I can. You know, call the engineers. And uh, we built these special Coravin. I made these, that we, have, we sell them on our website now, this premium needle. It doesn't have two distinct holes on the side like our normal needles. It has hundreds of holes that we laser drill. So it does absolutely no damage to the cork. And it was really thin and we low pressure Coravin. 
Uh, we normally go to one and a half atmospheres. This one went to like 0.7 atmospheres and brought it out there, flew out. They gave us a dozen bottles. Um, Chateau Chem was one of the ones with the labels. Uh, and so I had 1892, 96, and 98 Chateau Chem, which were stunning. Another white wine, aged beautifully, unbelievable. Uh, and then they, they wanted to prove the provenance. And so they had a master of wine there in the top sommelier in the Czech Republic. And then they brought out this red wine. It was a Corton Rouge, Burgundy Red uh, from a place. And it was like, I corvined it into a glass uh, using this thing, uh, this, this modified Corvin. And people, there was a whole stadium of people. And they pay people, you to do this? No. No, this, I, like, I was asked to come out. I left you want the me goal. to start negotiating for you? Or you... <laughs> so I got paid by wine. You could smell this wine meters away. That's like, it was 1899 Corton Rouge. It is the best thing I put past my lips. Uh, and so it's a rare experience, but when you have it. Yeah, that's rare. That's, right? In fact, I think it's bullshit. No, it was, you, I, I wish gonna, you were I'm there. I'm going to shut this door a little bit because <laughs> I'm getting blinded. Yeah, no problem. I mean, to, to close it on, oh, okay, good. Yeah, not the whole way, I can still see. I picked the good seat for anybody who's not, not watching. I'm not being blinded. I'm like, dude, it's, I'm trying to look at you and right next to you is this orange head. Yeah. It's just a little brighter than yours. The sun, I don't know. Yeah. So, so what's, like, what, what's your, other than that story, which is pretty banging, and, and you found your favorite bottle of wine you've ever had, Old yep. Red. Yep. What is your, what, what's, a, what, what's your next best story from the road? Because you, you have to travel, and you see people, and... Yeah, you know, one of the things that's great about my role... How many countries, first of all, do you think? We've been in 60, and I've launched in 30 or so of them. So I, I sort of took on the role. Nobody knows what a chairman does. That's why I chose the title. And uh, I could do whatever it is that I wanted to do. And so what I like to do is raise money. Uh, I enjoy that, advising the CEO on what to do. And so you, you like to raise money, so you think you can close, huh? Yeah. All right. <laughs> there we go. Got, and an uh, inventor has salesmanship. You've got to be able to, right? If, you've gotta, if you're going to invent something completely new. It's what you're here for. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to invent something completely new, there's going to be slings and arrows, and people are going to come at you. And you need to figure out how to sell past that. And so I wanted to be the first person in every country uh, as much as I possibly could. I love it. And uh, so I've been able to travel all over the world and meet with all sections of this wine industry, this wonderful wine world that we have from producers through consumers and everybody in between. Uh, I was scared crapless about going to uh, Burgundy uh, for the first time because their wines are the hardest to preserve, um, especially the older ones. And I like discovered that over time with my Coravin tests. I didn't know much about Burgundy. I wasn't a big Burgundy drinker because you'd spend a lot of money on a bottle and it would be bad. Or you'd spend a lot of money on a bottle and it would be good. And you didn't know. Uh, and I didn't yeah, understand and the usually reason. Usually it was bad. Yeah, a lot of them were. Brett, you know, just, yeah. Burgundy. A lot of them Burgundy's were. Burgundy's hard, man. It's tricky. And so I went there. There's one producer. um, is the first guy that I met in Burgundy. I was scared. I had an early device and went to Bonne de Martre, uh, which is, they, they, they make a Corton Charlemagne. And Jean Charles, who's the guy who owned it until he sold it to the guys at Screaming Eagle, um, was there and he comes to the door and I'm nervous and we brought a bottle and we show him how it works and it had never been seen in France. And he goes, can you wait one second? And he disappears, tall, thin guy, uh, really stately. And he comes back with this bottle and he goes, this is a bottle of uh, 1992, uh, Corton Charlemagne. This is a bottle that is the last wine that my mother made. She's passed away now. And I don't have many left. Can we please try this with your system? And so he'd gone from, I'd gone from, are they going to throw me out? Yeah. Because I'm like blasphemous to this guy bringing me his mom's last bottle. That's awesome. And you wear like an ascot in there? Because they're very <laughs> fancy over in Burgundy. They're, you know... Uh, I got to tell you, uh, you didn't go on in a t-shirt and jeans. Well, I know, but this is, this is post pandemic wear. And, um, and so I, uh, I'm a new England guy. And so, so you're already hoity. Yeah. No, in new England, we have, a, we have a uniform and, and, and new England medical is a blue blazer. Oh, I'm sorry about that. That's my phone right there. Uh, I, I, we wear a blue blazer and tan pants and you could be 20 years old. You could be 80 years old. You look the same. So that's what I was wearing. Peter used to joke about that. My uh, guy who sells the winery. So that was, he, he always predicted exactly what I was going to show up in. I loved the reception there. And I was talking a little bit about how culture influences how people respond to Corvin. You know, Bordeaux, they were cross-armed. I got kicked out of Chateau. They walked me to the door. A guy said he was going to insert a metal disc underneath his 
capsule to break every core of a needle. Uh, you know, and this is after my first meeting. Who was that? Uh, it was a guy who no longer works at Chateau Margaux. And uh, so it, what it, was his, what was the moron's reason? I, he was like, you're going to be used for counterfeiting. And I was like, how, you know, these needles have existed since the 1800s developed during a civil war. You know, you could, I don't want to say it actually on how you can use it to counterfeit. You can't use Corvin to counterfeit, but you could have used the needles to. And it's just a, uh, so anyway, he was freaked. And, uh, and then Burgundy, I go there. These guys, you know what he was doing? He's protecting yeah. what they not stole over there, but you know, they got a good gig going on. They, they do. Uh, they do. Several hundred years ago. Well, now uh, Chateau Margaux is the number one user of Corvin. A bunch of big white guys decided <laughs> who was going to be first growth and who wasn't yeah. based on zero science, based on who had maybe made a couple good wines up to that date. But That's now it. you can't break in. No. Can you imagine two guys like me and you, entrepreneurs being told we can't break in? Yeah. Like, the thought of Bordeaux is psychotic. You and France do not intersect. No, I, not even a little bit. No, but you know what? Wow. Burgundy, those guys accepted it. Arms open, uh, wonderful people. Rhone accepted it. Mark well, Ferrand, Rhone, Bocastel here. He, the Rhone guys are like me, man. Yeah. They're just, you know, torn shoes. and. Mark's our importer. Uh, uh, Mark Perrant, Bo Castell, he's our importer he's for Corvin. He, he's they, a dude. They, they've done a great job, and he's got the, they got the place here with Tablas. But let's be honest with each other. The Bordelais think they're better than everybody. Uh, Toughest group I've it, run into. If any of them were sitting here right now, I'd, I'd say it to their face. It, it's everything I despise about our industry is that aristocracy of we're better, ba baseless we're better. This is the most subjective business in the world. Like You yeah. may like a super acidic one and I may like that super Hermitage that we talked about heavy wine you may like a light red uh, not above 12 alcohol I may like full throttle 15.5 yeah uh, it, it, nobody's right or wrong it's just we want everybody drinking wine they have gone out of their way over the last 200 years to tell people that they are wrong this is the way it's done this is right this is wrong it's all about terroir and i'm not going to get you in trouble because you got to do business there so I, and since i don't uh, we'll, we'll i've me... got great friends there now and but it took what it takes is bang your head against a concrete wall until you find a crack and that crack was obayi a I, I, producer and she open armed and she flipped um lynch Bosch. And they flipped Obreon and... Yeah, but Lynch Bosch still can't get in the old boy club. Yeah, no, no, they can't. They're on but their second wines level looking in. Oh, you same know? thing, same thing. Yeah, and yeah, I, I don't like that. Who's ever's better wins and... It's uh, a very American thing. You know, a long time ago, I used to work in Japan and uh, speak Japanese, was working there in my first career in physics. And uh, How do you I, say fuck off in Japanese? Kusokurai. <laughs> Kusokurai. <laughs> Eat shit, literally. Yeah. Kuso kurai? Kuso. Kuso. Which is shit. Kurai, which is eat as a command. Like kurai. Kuso yeah. kurai. <laughs> there, there we go. Now oh. everybody knows. That's, that's like one of the top insults in Japan. So uh, to all the Japanese listeners out there, you know. Kuso kurai. Okay. Yeah, there we go. So that, it's a really important insult. Hey, why we're rolling? You hit, hit that red real yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I can't wait. What that's am that's I that. doing? My sommelier skills for are poor. 14 estate, yeah. I am we're weak. We're drink some wine, aren't we? Oh, and I'm going to give somebody a tip. So you use wax in your bottles, which I, ab I absolutely love. I Doesn't quit. Oh, did you? We got fucking bagged on every psalm in America, every waiter. <laughs> they hate Ours it. Ours are soft, though. I know. You can Chablis go straight there. is the worst. So the, wine, so the wines I was going to get re ready to bring, I was going to bring uh, a Merceau or a Shoshan yeah. from two baller houses, yeah. but it's both that hard. That's fine. The wax, you got to heat up under the sink. Sure. Otherwise, it goes everywhere. You're it big. shatters. So it, goes, we, it shatters. The it needle goes will go wine. through. The needle will win. The Booker, the, the, the Paso guys all use the... The, the, the soft, soft stuff. Yeah. It's great stuff. And I think it actually makes a difference. Uh, although, you know, who knows? But we stopped just because we took a lot of shit. So we've got this new system with the smart clamp. So you just place it on top and push straight down like so. But with uh, wax, I tend to pull the clamp down by hand first and then push down. Do you, are you worried that that wax is going to get in your holes? No. Okay. Uh, if it's the only thing you're accessing, it will eventually. It's the same. If it's the only thing you're doing, like we have some wineries like you guys that use a lot of wax. And they will say, hey, you know... Um, you're clogging my needle after a long time. But uh, if you're doing it at home... I always rinse the needle just for me. I probably am being stupid. I just take it, flip it over, run water on it just to keep it clean. Sure. 
and I run water through the nozzle. That's it. And then I blow out. All right. So I'll. So I'll, I'm wasting my time running the water on the bottom. I'll clearly. give you. You are. Um, so I'll. But it's not a bad waste of time, and your hands are clean. So it's a pandemic. So the uh, the the thing that I like to tell people: clean, clear, and cellar. Uh, and then I'll teach them how to how to conserve gas if you're using the, sta- the sa- standard system. So clean, clear, and cellars with every Corvin system. Clean means wash it. People think of it as a corkscrew, and they never wash their corkscrew. You got to wash it. And the way you wash it is just to, like you described: hot water through the spout, the end of an evening, cleans it, makes sure nothing grows in it. Uh, clear. If we just poured uh, Booker Red, if I wanted to go back to the white. You'd want to inject a little bit of red wine into the white. Give the trigger a quick press, and it pushes the wine out yeah. of the needle, and and you can go straight into the next wine. And then cellar. Keep the bottle stored on its side. Keep it cold. We don't protect against light and heat. Um, if you want the wine to last, store it well. Uh, and then for... Wipe your hand off on your jeans. <laughs> so yeah, rub it in. I don't want it on that fancy oh, shirt. I don't if know. that shirt's pressed, there's pleats, there's there's iron marks. Do you know on how it? hard it was for me not to wear a blue blazer? I feel naked as a New Englander. I had <laughs> you guys moved me outside. I had to get all warm. I had a t-shirt God. and jeans. So this isn't everything. I love your one. This isn't everything one. This has temper neo. Where, where the hell am I glad? What would I be Here, I can read it for you. Glasses? <laughs> This wine has is the kitchen sink. So this is the 14. It's 51% Tempranillo, 28% Syrah, 13% Petit Verdot, and 8% Grenache. So Paso Robles. other than the two from all different uh, regions uh, of wine, basically, you got a little Temp, a little Petit Verdot, then you got a couple. Has little, that ever happened in history? Is that like a, just a, a it Booker did construction? Here. It just, the estate is always whatever we want to, we want to mix a little from all of the estate in. It's beautiful. So, you don't have any, like, I'm not talking nutbags swinging off chandeliers, circus type stuff going on. But <laughs> you're talking about all these hoity toity things. Are you fancy. calling me an engineer and a nerd? Well, yes. Well, no, yes, I'm just saying. Got ho- <laughs> Pepper, he's got a lot of hoity toity stories. And what I was kind of looking for was like, you walk in and maybe there was a winery that decided they like to pour wine naked or something. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, or it got <laughs> weird, like, you know. <laughs> Let's see what I mean. You you don't have to mention names. uh, No, just be you. You know, Uh, but the the. uh the weird ones that I love are where you're like, the reality is that a winery is, has a farmer and has a production facility. Right. And so it's true manufacturing, yeah. right. And farming and manufacturing. I was in Germany and uh, I walk in and there's like one of the top producers of a uh, Pinot Noir in Germany. And he, he, I come in to show him Corbin and he looks at me, he goes uh, in, in English, I'm sorry, I'm in the shit. <laughs> He's like, hands are covered in blue. His clothes are covered in grapes. Some valve just blew. Well, it's <laughs> nothing to talk to you about. Right, exactly. He's lost fucking 100,000 uh, 100, gallons of wine out of a tank. You know, he was not happy. And his son comes out. His son's got to be nine. And he's head to toe, like hair to his shoes, purple <laughs> this poor kid and he's like dad i think i found it <laughs> can we say that maybe like he was naked no there's no naked just, no, no there's naked. Not... i just haven't seen the naked just... I, I well mean, we don't even need naked I just... roberto conterno uh i'm gonna teach my son how to ride a motorcycle so i've only got like 30 minutes and roberto roberto conterno makes giacomo conterno which is one of the i mean like monfortino it's my guy I'm a, it's I'm a, the shit yeah the guy is a dude as well, and you know, um, he's a made man in Italy. And I don't think he's ever married. Mary, maybe he has. I don't understand why he would. But anyway, he uh, he takes us. He gets so infatuated with Corvin, he takes us downstairs, and we're barrel tasting through like dozens and dozens of these big tanks. I'm just shit faced at this point, and and he's. I'm like I'm like drinking, and I start hearing this motorcycle go whipping by, and we're below ground, and we, this is like half window that we're looking up through, and his son is ripping by without a helmet at like 80 miles an hour on the driveway, and he's like, it'll be fine, and apparently he flies a helicopter uh, as well, so he's a risk taker, and we all just lean against the wall and drink, and I kind of pass out for half an hour, 45 minutes, but that's, you know, I don't, uh, I don't have many exciting stories. I am a nerd. Well, that's, you know, I guess, you know, in some parts of the world that might be exciting. Right. Pepper, do you want me to tell a story about Italy? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> people swinging off chandeliers and five in the morning, mm. Jekyll and Hyde type. Uh, Italians no. know how to party. I'd live there if it wasn't for the law. Yeah, Italians uh, do know how to party. The problem is they 
they just keep stuffing food down your throat at all hours. Is of that, that a right? problem? It's just <laughs> like, here, have more. Just don't like, eat just for a week. 14 <laughs> courses. I mean, and it's one in the morning. Do we really need to? It's not low calorie. No. Right. Yeah. It's like everything gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And actually the desserts are the lightest things they serve. Yeah. Right. <laughs> everything else is huge. But you know what? I love it. This is why I picked up marathon running. So yeah. you're a marathon runner. Yeah. Yeah. I run uh, Pikes Peak Marathon. Uh, Boston, I've run a bunch of times and it's the only way to, so I like as an inventor, what's your workout is your regiment in a gym or is your regiment, uh, running? No, it's running. Uh, Have you, did you run here this morning? I haven't. Um, I, so my other company is a spine. So I, I spend 50% of my life in spine surgery and 50% of my time in wine. So spine and wine and it crosses over cause all the surgeons drink and, uh, all I of them yeah. never get surgery on a Monday. I'm just going to say it. Don't do it. <laughs> I always tell my surgeon, hey, I, I sent my guy for my shoulder a text like, hey, buddy, uh, a guy named Buddy Savoie of New Orleans. No wine tonight, bro. Yep. Like, I need your there, ass. There we shot. go. So never get, this is, there was a study done and it proved never get surgery on a Monday, never get surgery on a Friday afternoon. You want 11 a.m. on a Wednesday. Because that, that's when they are most sober, most fully recovered from whatever it was. Nobody's been drinking for a while. So uh, it's reality. Surgeons are humans, right? And, um, and so they, yeah, they, there's a lot of Corvin using surgeons that drink a lot of great wine. They can only drink a glass because they got to be sober the next day. So that's, that's half my life. But ironically, I work on a product for disc herniation and sciatica and the like. Uh, disc what? Disc herniation. So when you okay. rupture a disc or slip disc in the back. And it compresses a nerve. And yeah, don't go too deep into that. Yeah. I, 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 I fix it. I you're know already I, losing me right now with that I one. I can make everybody feel squirm in pain. Anyway, uh, I have a ruptured disc in my back. And so... Uh, Did you disc or whatever? Yeah, disc herniate. I've got a disc herniation right now, and it's acting up. So I'm probably going to need my own product. And it, anyway, it makes it harder. So right. half the time you're spending with that. And do you have the label as a doctor? Uh, no, I'm, uh, so I've been, my favorite stories are the, the newspapers, which do no fact checking and publish these articles on me. I've been a urologist, a proctologist. Those are my favorite, a cardiac surgeon, an oncologist, uh, the number of degrees that, uh, that newspapers have given me, uh, it's crazy. No, I'm not a doctor. I'm a physicist and a mechanical engineer. So I went to so you're probably the smartest guy in the room, but Maxie over here is a current I know he's going into engineer. biomedical engineering. And, you know, you're out of the game a little bit. I want to bring so him into speak, our company. <laughs> speaking of like proctologists and urologists, uh, mm -hmm. as we all love to, I mean, over 50, I was at a dinner <laughs> in, uh, Blackberry farm. Has Beautiful anybody spot. here been to Blackberry Farm? Never been. Uh, one, seen pictures. One of the nicest resorts. Always rated as one of the nicest resorts in the world. Yeah, really? Chateau? Definitely in the uh, United States. It's in the Blackberry Mountains, uh, uh, or Blackberry Mountains, the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, the Blackberry Mountains. <laughs> Clearly, I'm starting to swallow. Uh, <laughs> and I'm at a table with a bunch of urologists, or doctors. Most and, fun and a couple people. couple of our urologists. And we, we're banging a little bit. And uh, so I get enough in me. And, you know, shit flies. I don't have a filter. It gets me into trouble, which is why I'm probably unemployable. I always have to be like an independent contractor. Same here. Different reasons. And I look at the one dude and everyone got quiet because like they gave me the floor and I said, at what? At what fucking point in medical? You have 16 years to think about it. At what point do you go? Do you want to handle, <laughs> unless you're on the other team, which I'm totally cool with, but... He was married <laughs> to a woman. Yeah, yeah. So at what point, like, if I'm married to a man, then of I'm all gonna, the professions, yeah. who chooses your own? But he just decided <laughs> out of nowhere, and I said to him, like, at what point did you choose to go and? I was in a case with a urologist to, to develop products for urologists, holding and studying the penis as he was, opposed to. <laughs> he was removing a stone, and he pulls a stone from this guy's urethra. It's a, it's like a seventy five year old guy, and you pull a stone from the urethra, and a guy who's pl plugged, you just get urine all over you. So he's like getting peed on, like, and he, and he looks up at the sky and he goes, "I live in urine." I am urine. Those are the guys <laughs> you want to watch out for when it gets I, dark. Like that, that, <laughs> that, when the web came on, those guys then had a place to go. They are the funniest They physicians. had a place to like find <laughs> others. I love urologists. Yeah. I, I was sitting in this one guy's office and I was going to pitch him on a, a program where my co-founder and I we were inventing new products for different medical fields and urology was one of them. And he's the head of NYU urology. And so I walk into his office in Park Avenue or whatever and there's like a 70-year-old guy standing next to me and he walks out and he looks at the 70-year-old guy and he goes jensen not jensen well whoa, 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 whoa. 
<laughs> Jensen, what is it? Syphilis? I can't remember. Is it gonorrhea? Too many women, right? And this poor 75-year-old guy looking up at him and he goes, I'm just kidding. Come on back. <laughs> the poor guy's got prostate problems. I, like, I, uh, I, I Listen, <laughs> I, at that moment, I could get a urologist, right? Because that, that, that's easy to understand, right? The ass doctor is the difficult Yeah, one. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> prob- no, I don't know. probing that area, I, I, that I'm relatively certain that every proctologist had a family member who suffered from a disease that was treated by a proctologist. Yeah, that, you go into orthopedics, you see a lot of guys who played sports, right? And they blew out their ACL or they blew out their shoulder or whatever. They had surgery and they got better. And I think it's, that is why somebody chooses a path 90% of the time. Or it's like some really motivating guy in the hospital that they go into that, I, like I got pulled in by this guy at NYU and I was like, ah, maybe I'd be a urologist if I was a doctor. I don't, I don't know. Plastic surgery. Plastic surgery. I mean, <laughs> no insurance, on. private pay. Yeah, yeah. Right, what the hell? <laughs> you get to see all sides and you know. Yeah, and you know what? They're, they have a Zen Buddhist, like this is like I've gotten to work with, this is the privilege. I've gotten to be with wine producers and stunningly beautiful places and really good people in general in the wine industry. And I've gotten to work with wine, with surgeons all over the world, Australia, Germany, the Netherlands, the United States, all sorts of different fields. I mean, I love people and they all have a story in some way yeah. or another, but uh, surgeons uh, have this amazing ability to connect with somebody on a very personal level. Plastic surgeons work on trauma, right? They work on burn, and then they work on boob jobs, and then they work on nose jobs, uh, and butt implants, apparently. Penis enlargement? <laughs> and there we go, penis enlargement. The Take butt implant is the one that confuses me. Like, how did that catch hold? Right, exactly. exactly. Like, we spent a hundred years trying to get rid of the butt. This is the moment where the then, team takes off the headphones. <laughs> and then we spent the next hundred trying to make it bigger. I don't get that. When are the, is there going to be a day when they insert a larger belly for us? You never know. You never know. I will uh, die before that happens. Yeah, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to work on abs. I don't need that implant. But listen, brother, what a great time. Uh, it's always great to talk to you. Can't wait to go to dinner. We're going to uh, local favorite in town, Beale Brasserie, for some... Uh, French bistro food. That's fantastic. I already know what I'm ordering right now. I'll take, um, I'll take suggestions. Uh, the place is great. The guy, the chef is formally trained. Uh, he is, uh, French and a wonderful guy. And, uh, we're gonna have a great dinner for everybody out there. We got a, we actually, we've never done like a pimp deal on this. We just kind of do this. Nobody pays anybody. I push people. In we direction. offend a lot of people, <laughs> but Booker likes to support because we use it so much. We love the the relationship we have with you because we're we're all actual users. Everybody in the company actively uses it, and we talk about our wines. We're just geeks about it. We have a promo code, yeah, called neighborhood neighbor. or something. Neighbor. neighbor. So if you just enter neighbor on the uh, coravin dot com okay. website. Uh, you'll get 10% off of, of uh, anything on our site. And we are so privileged to be able to actually now be selling your wine uh, on our site. We've chosen a bunch of wines from around the world that we love. And we've been able to offer them on our site at wine.corvin.com. So we've got Booker uh, on a couple of different of your wines. You guys are moving to the wine business Yeah, now. you right. know, we, uh, you'll see what's coming next. All right. Well, we're going to drink some wine tonight. We're going to eat some food. Uh, pivot is the pivot and the champagne are like to me my next moves i've got multiple these are go-to they're awesome uh for those of you guys that that want to start with a champagne move to a white go to a red and have friends over and say what do you want i got a bottle you talked about staying cronky earlier and to the rams uh yeah cheers uh, he brought a first super bowl home uh, uh a ways back there but uh <laughs> nonetheless uh so, yeah, we lost Tom Brady. So, you know, uh, we're done in New England. Yeah, it's over. <laughs> I'm just uh, saying. <laughs> but to be able to pop into like a Screaming Eagle and say, well, we're not going to kill the whole bottle, but we want to compare it to this to this. And there's only three of us. So we want to open six bottles. I don't want to open six bottles and finish the night with a bottle of uh, a sip of bourbon yeah. or an old fashioned or a sip of tequila. So, Greatest invention. I dig you. Thank you, man. You made my life better. You made a lot of our wives better. You're out of wine. But, I got a little uh, bit of white left, which I'm psyched about. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, Appreciate guys. you chiming in. Support this guy. He's the real deal. The company's the real deal. And uh, until next time, peace.